Thanks, Rob. Um, and thanks to Elizabeth and uh, ERA for inviting Hans here today to speak. Um, I want to start off by asking a question. If you can just imagine yourself in your late 50s, happily retired for more than five years, um, all your hobbies in place, doing exactly what you want to do, enjoying every minute of it. Um, grandkids on the way, enjoying the good life, no financial pressure to return to the workforce. And you get a phone call, a phone call from somebody you've known for a long time, asking you if you want to get involved with something. And uh, something that's been in the works for over 10 years, something that would create a lot of employment in central Alberta, thousands of jobs, something that would be expected to generate over $15 billion in incremental taxes and royalties to the province of Alberta over its lifetime. Something that would reduce Alberta's carbon footprint. Something that would create an incremental new supply of ultra low carbon fossil fuel. So that's the question I had and the answer is obvious. I chose to get involved. Um, Stay retired, join the workforce. And the person who called me, you may know, you may have heard speak. He's an entrepreneur, he's a visionary. He's the founder of the idea of the Sturgeon Refinery, and he's the founder of Enhanced Energy. His name is Ian McGregor. Um, it wasn't an easy decision, but I saw it as a chance to take what I'd learned over the 30 years in my time in industry and do something good, something good for Canada, something good for Alberta, and something good for our kids. And there were some... A few tough times over the last three years where I wasn't sure I could stand up here and say this, but I'm really glad I made the decision I did. Um, because today, I can tell you that the Alberta Carbon, carbon Trunk Line is fully funded and under construction as we speak with pipe going in the ground today. We anticipate to have our first CO2 going in the ground by the end of 2019, sometime in the fourth quarter. So just a brief description of the ACTL project for some of you folks who haven't followed it as closely. Um, we take CO2 from two sources in the industrial heartland. Uh, the uh, fertilizer facility operated by Nutrien and the Sturgeon Refinery. We compress it on site, put it in a large diameter pipeline, 240 kilometers down the road. Uh, we end up at a, just east of the uh, city of Lacombe, and we put it in an enhanced recovery operation at Clive. A little bit about, more about who's Enhance. So Enhance and Northwest Refining, who is the 50% owner of the Sturgeon Refinery, were both founded by the same shareholder group led by Ian McGregor. Um, so after, over a long period of time, after several hundred million dollars of equity investments in both companies, they today they have a they're totally arm's length companies today. They have very uh, diverse shareholder bases. They own their own separate boards, totally arm's length, and they have their own vested interests. So just a little cartoon of uh, the stakeholders in the project as it sits today. So if you look on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see uh, a cartoon of an enhanced oil recovery operation. That's what Enhance does. That's our business. We take the CO2 off the Alberta carbon trunk line and uh, conduct our enhanced oil recovery operations. On the left-hand side of the screen, you've got the sources, you've got the, north, the Northwest Refinery, and the, I always say Agrium, but it's now Nutrien Fertilizer Facility. They both produce a pure CO2 stream. They hand off that CO2 stream to a company called Wolf, who is going to own, construct, and operate the compression, the on-site compression, and the pipeline to deliver that CO2 to uh, Central Alberta to enhance at its Clive operation. So you've probably heard more about Nutrien in Northwest than you have about Wolf. So maybe talk a little bit about there. You're going to hear a bit about uh, from Wolf this afternoon in a panel. But Wolf's a relatively new player in the scene in Alberta. They're a midstream company. The company doing this work is Wolf Carbon Solutions. They're a company with immense financial depth. Uh, their uh, shareholder is the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. They're uh, very deep technically for a small company, and they're very cost conscious, they're entrepreneurial, they're a perfect fit for the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. So Enhance owns and operates oil fields where we target CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. We're not a CO2 capture company, 
we utilize CO2. We purchase CO2 from the sources. We put it on the pipeline. We pay a toll to get the CO2 to our EOR operations, and we use it for CO2. So essentially our business is a production of oil made possible through the efficient utilization of CO2. So what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes or so is talk about some of the lessons we've learned over the last 10 years. There's a lot more than 10 minutes of lessons there, but I'll try and boil it down to the top 10. Um, so really, this discussion and lessons are going to focus on finance and development because, of course, we're just constructing and, and not operating yet. We certainly learned some things in that area. We'll leave the, the construction and development or operation lessons for maybe Chapter 2, maybe next year or the year after. So lesson number one, and appropriately, first things first, um, CO2 supply. So we've been pursuing the project for almost 10 years, and the road has certainly had some bumps and twists and turns along the way. So this project's supply source is at, uh, or two, it's Nutrien and the Northwest Refinery, but it's very clear that the anchor supply for our project is Northwest. Um, we're expecting about 3,500 tons a day of CO2 from Northwest, and this project uh, totally depends on, on that 3,500 tons for its economic viability. And that refinery, as we probably all know, experienced a few challenges and delays of its own along the way. So any, we found that any investors who we were talking to to raise capital for the project, they may have had an appetite and understood risks of enhanced oil recovery development where you've got commodity risks and cost risks, but there was absolutely no appetite for any uncertainty in CO2 supply. So it took until sometime in 2014 uh, before the refinery was uh, was uh, essentially had its financing complete, structured, partly under construction to remove the uncertainty in that supply. So any attempts we made to raise funds for our project before that were destined to fail, and they did. We certainly made, we, we certainly had some efforts there, but uh, made not a lot of progress. It kind of seems obvious now, but without certainty of supply, uh, you're not going to finance a, any aware development project. The other thing we learned is, is how large is the, the potential capital pool for, to fund a project like this. Uh, when we started out, we were looking for a, private, a single private equity partner who would be able to fund about a 300 to $350 million investment. So if you look at private equity, uh, most funds uh, have what they call a 10% a rule. Makes a lot of sense. They don't want to put any more than 10% of their fund capital into any one project. They want to compart they want to spread their risk. So what that meant, if we we're trying to raise three to 350 million dollars, we needed to find a fund that had at least three to four billion dollars in capital, and that eliminated a lot of funds. So it shrunk our market, our target. In addition, uh, a lot of funds aren't going to put 300 million dollars into a project that's new to them. So we, we targeted funds that had already invested in CO2 EOR, were familiar with it, or had management that was familiar with it, and that shrunk our pool again. So even though I've always viewed that there's no shortage of money in the world, there's only a shortage of good ideas, and I felt we had the short commodity, which was a really good idea and a good project, uh, we found our capital pool was a lot smaller than we expected when we first started out. So what do you do when the capital markets aren't there? So if you look back at 2014, oil was about $100 a barrel, and it was on its way to, I think it hit a low of about 28 in February 16, and it's quite a crystal ball I had. Is That's kind of when I joined and, and got involved, so it, the job certainly ended up being a little more difficult than I anticipated. Um, Enhance was a, a small private development company looking to finance an ambitious EUR low-carbon oil development project. But during 15 and 16, it was essentially risk off in terms of trying to bring private equity in to a project like this. Uh, nobody was prepared to think outside the box. Those funds were there to invest in conventional, I call conventional resource plays and not much else. And even that was, uh, was, was very difficult to bring money in for that. So I think back to that time, I think of, uh, I think it was in February of 2016 and we were talking to a, very viable funding partner and and you know they talk big they say yeah oil's 28 dollars, but it's not going to stay there we all know it's going up but having said that 
uh, we said, well, let's, let's, let's get moving. And uh, the comment was, Kevin, we're not going to be putting money in at $28. We need to see a definite bottom. There's just, there's just no way we're sitting on the sidelines. And that's, that was reality. There was no money coming in at that time. And uh, so even later in 16, when the oil price had firmed up, uh, I recall we were probably well into the 50s and everybody felt like uh, we were kind of out of the lows. I remember talking to a, a, a fund manager from the largest private equity group in New York. And uh, I said, well, is, is now the time? Is now the time when you guys are going to start to get back in? And he said, well, to be honest, we're like sheep. He said, we're not going first. And this is the biggest private equity player in New York. And he said, if we jump, if we go in and this isn't a recovery and it's another dip, he said, that's career limiter and nobody in this shop's prepared to take that one. So, you know, when the game's not on, what do you do? So when the markets take a breather, maybe you should too. But, so when there's no bid, what do you do? You, whether you're trying to sell your house into this Calgary real estate market today or whether you're trying to sell oil when the, there's more supply and demand, do you keep dropping your price? Do you take a breather or do you innovate? And uh, so that's what we decided to do. So we spent 2015 through 2016 uh, looking at our project. So in 2014, oil was 100 and it was clear that that wasn't going to stay around. So our project had $50, the numbers weren't adding up. So we had to re-engineer our project. So we looked at our capital costs, our operating costs, our CO2 utilization efficiency, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. We looked at everything we could to, uh, to improve the economics of the project. Uh, we were no different than everybody else in the industry, whether it's the conventional resource guys that were getting the drilling costs down and increasing their frack sizes, frack densities, going to multi-well pads, everything. They had to do the same thing we did. And they were successful, and so were we. So by the end of 16, we had a project that at $50 a barrel showed as good of economics as it did at 100 two years, two years earlier. So I mentioned uh, CO2 utilization. So what that means to us in our industry is... How much CO2 do we utilize and leave in the ground permanently to produce a barrel of oil? That's a, that's a very important factor in our business, it's a, and it's a critical feature of our project, and we had to reduce that utilization. We had to figure out a way to flood more reservoirs and produce more oil with the same amount of CO2. That was a big driver for us. So we became very innovative and succeeded because we had to. But we found that the ACTL project had an additional risk that I didn't see coming in. Um, for a typical energy development, you've got risks of commodity pricing and costs and reserves and production and all those things that I'd spent my 30 years dealing with and managing and funding projects that had those risks. But the ACTL project was counting on $300 million of contribution from the Alberta government uh, under a 2010 funding agreement. Uh, as part of construction. And those funds came in uh, as we constructed. And uh, so that was part of our, part of our uh, economic uh, reality. And uh, in the spring of 15, terminating all CCS funding was a platform of the incoming government. So at that time, we were actually talking to private equity, private equity who had the capital, private equity who had the experience in c 2 eur And after election night, we never got a phone call. And the phone went dead. So that's a reality. That's a risk we had to deal with. And uh, one thing I can say, though, is since the government reaffirmed its its commitment to CO2 EOR and our project and our funding, um, and uh, that we've had nothing but support at all levels. There's a group sitting here we spent lots of time with, and uh, I want to thank them. They helped us get to where we're at today in making this project a reality. So I'll talk a little bit about grant structure because um, that has a big impact on financing it did have on ours. So our initial thoughts that we would only need to raise 300 to $350 million for this project. That was a net amount after grants. And the grants in our case were available as we constructed. There was milestones. We reached a milestone. We got to draw some grants. So that was a 
capital we didn't have to raise. Uh, the thing with our grant structure was we had to supply a letter of credit from a Schedule A bank to the province to receive the grant. And that's, that letter of credit would be held by the province until we reached commercial operations, which would be 30 days of CO2 going in the ground. So we looked at that and we said, well, it's, it's still, so, still very doable. We raised capital lots of times before. We raised debt. And after all, this is only short-term debt. It's really only sitting out there for 12 to 18 months. Um, and then the project's built and the letters of credit are returned. Um, and uh, the risks of it, there were no uh, commodity pricing risk on that, on that lending. There was no uh, reserve risk. Um, there was only project execution risk, and I mean, how much risk is there in building a compressor in a pipeline and getting CO2 in the ground? <laughs> uh, we were wrong. We were dead wrong. That was a very hard piece of business, and uh, it was probably far and away the most complicated piece of our financing, of our total financing, was placing, raising that uh, bridge debt to place those letters of credit. And thanks in large part to Wolf, who, uh, who were a participant at that time, and they helped us get that done. But it was extremely complicated, extremely expensive, and I would guess it probably added six months to our closing time horizon just to get that, that uh, those letters of credit funded and financed. So that kind of grant structure is not a problem for companies who finance with their Treasury Department. Um, large companies, maybe Shell as an example. Um, but for a small private company like Enhance, essentially doing project-based financing, it became a big challenge. So I'll talk a little bit about low carbon fuels. Um, you may have heard a lot about the Sturgeon refinery. You probably heard some today producing low carbon diesel, but we think there's another way to look at the benefits from CO2 sequestered by this project. This is CO2 that would otherwise have been vented as it's been vented today at Nutrien for the last 40 years in the refinery, and we're using it to produce light oil in central Alberta. So the process of CO2 EUR requires somewhere between 0.3 and 0.7 tons for every barrel of oil we produce. If we're really efficient, 0.3 tons. If we're less efficient, pushing the economic limit, 0.7 tons. That's kind of the range. And if you take, if you look at the barrel we produce, that barrel, the amount of CO2 it takes to produce it, uh, process it, refine it, and combust it, it's about 0.4 tons. So 0.3 to 0.7 is permanently sequestered to produce a barrel that emits about 0.4. So if you look at this chart, it's a net emissions intensity of a number of fossil fuels. Starting on the left, you've got coal, you've got oil, natural gas, three bars on the left. The, the two bars on the right, we're looking at the range of net carbon emissions from CO2 EUR. So the, the second bar from the left would be the 0.3 ton efficiency level where we are fairly efficient and we don't sequester as much CO2 for every barrel. And the bar on the right would be the 0.7. So that's the range. We could actually be carbon negative if we're less efficient than, uh, than, we, than we would like to be. And what drives that number is more uh, the price of oil. Of course, that's our revenue of our business, the price on carbon things like that. So um, it's really an economic decision as to how efficient you need to be to be in the business. The other thing we've learned is really what's good for CO2 EUR and CCUS is good for carbon capture. So CCUS using CO2 EUR today in Alberta, if we look at just the capacity for that around the Alberta carbon trunk line, somewhere between a half a billion and a billion tons. That's a big, big number. That's actually about 20 times the target that our current government has in their climate leadership plan in terms of their, their oil and gas emission reduction target between now and 2030. Any improvements in those opportunities for CCUS means really a larger market. The market could be bigger than that and a higher potential value for this EOR quality CO2. So if any of you are developers of, of carbon capture and carbon purification technology looking for an economic market for your pure CO2, then we're very aligned. Uh, the more value there is in, in our business, the higher the demand and the higher the price we can afford to pay for that CO2. So 
So we got many challenges left. Um, you've heard the, the talk about stability from Brian earlier today. What we really need is stability and certainty in regulation of CO2 EOR and CCUS. We need an appropriate and predictable price on carbon. We'd like to see a robust and liquid market for sequestration credits. When we put CO2 in the ground, we generate a sequestration credit. That's the value that allows us to, to uh, make our business sustainable. We'd like to see stable commodity pricing. I guess we'd all like to see that. And reasonable differentials. That's a differentials today certainly uh, wouldn't result in a sustainable EOR business. And of course, we need to be successful in our EOR operations. We need to be efficient and we efficiently utilize CO2. So we look forward to continued support of, of everyone and helping us meet our challenges. And, and we look forward to materially reducing Alberta's carbon footprint by turning CO2 into a value-added commodity. Thank you, and uh, thanks for listening.